that as much as the last chapter often brings people back in the game where they go, okay, I'm okay now. I can do this stuff. I'm understanding the lessons. I'm getting them through a lot of the homework. This chapter really braces people. This chapter really pulls it together because a lot of the stuff in this chapter you already did in grade 10. We're reviewing a lot of the stuff in grade 10. And the stuff we didn't do in grade 10, a lot of it we did in chapter 1. Okay, so it's bringing together a lot of big ideas all together in one, one chapter here. So, and it's in two parts. There's two parts of it. So again, the people who are trying to get this thing rolling back the other way often find this is the chapter that starts everything settled back in nicely. Okay, so if you've had any trouble along the way, restart today and listen to what I have to say today because you might find, oh, this is the stuff that I can sort of handle. I'm pretty good at this. Quadratic functions. Was that word used enough in grade 10? Well, I'm not sure, but here, this is what we call them, quadratic functions of the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. That's a fancy math way of saying we're going to have squared terms in here. And that, all that, that comes with it, with factoring and all those things that come along with that. Where a is not equal to 0. Well, there's no point having an x squared term if a is equal to 0. So again, that's just math technical stuff saying, by the way, don't let your a be equal to 0. These are called quadratic functions. So anytime you've got highest exponent 2, or anytime you've got an x squared term, you're talking about a quadratic. The graph of this type of function is a parabola. Now listen, if you're already sort of bored with this lesson, I say, good. It's not very often as a teacher my goal is to bore you. But this that I'm building is an awesome study sheet or a reference sheet when you're doing homework. You're like, what does this word even mean? This is your reference sheet. So this is not exciting. It reminds me more of like a, uh, some biology lessons, right? When you're just copying down what the teacher says and memorizing the terms. But maybe that's a nice break from all the heavy math we've been doing. Yeah? The highest or lowest point of the parabola, well, let's try and get you involved a little bit anyways. The highest or lowest point of the parabola is called the that point right there, what's its fancy name? The vertex. And if you were thinking max or min, that's correct too. Vertex is the general name, but specifically we might call that the maximum or minimum, depending on what's going on. But the general term is vertex. Parabolas can either open up or down. There's two ways that parabolas can go. If a parabola opens upwards, it will have a, well, we saw this last chapter and we saw why it happens. If the number out front is just a vertical stretch, not a reflection, so it has a positive a value, then this thing will open up. This value will be the blank coordinate of the vertex. This note tries to go a little farther and talk about the x value of the vertex from there. I don't want to talk about it there. This is not the right time and it confuses the issue. So I'll just put a little line through that saying, yeah, I'm going to talk about that, but this isn't the right time for that just yet, to talk about the, um, the what coordinate of the vertex we're talking about. I just want to keep it simple. If a parabola opens downwards, it will have a negative a value. And again, I don't want to get hung up in the coordinates at this particular moment in this lesson. I will. I will talk about coordinates in just a second. Now, parabolas are symmetrical. Do you know what the word symmetrical means? Same on both sides. So if you graph one side, you can just make a copy of that on the other. A parabola flips over itself. And what I mean by that is it has a vertical line of symmetry. Art people, do you guys talk about lines of symmetry? Who's, who's taking art right now? You guys talk about lines of symmetry? Oh, well, you'll get there and you'll start talking about some lines of symmetry and so on. And basically, here's the line of symmetry. It's just a line that says, hey, on the right side of this, it will be a mirror copy of the left side, flipped over that line. And this thing here, and you may want to draw it in your picture so you can see it. This thing's called the axis of symmetry. Very fancy name to say the middle line. So the vertical line of symmetry, which is called, and I'll put it in your note here, axis of symmetry passes through the vertex. That's how you find it, is it goes right through the vertex. Are we okay so far? Does this all seem a little familiar from grade 10? Yeah. Negative 
my negative didn't look too good there, so I just fixed it up. Any questions there? Yeah, for sure. Questions? More time? The points where a parabola intersects the x-axis are called the x-intercepts. I don't know what else to say about that. Sometimes in math, the words don't make a lot of sense, but here I think they do sort of make a lot of sense. The x-intercepts are where it's going to meet the x-axis. I'll go back and put them on here. See, on this one here, those are the x-intercepts right there. Or the zeros. We sometimes call them the zeros. These points have y-coordinate of zero. Answering the question, why are they called zeros? Well, because their y-coordinate will be zero. That's really important. Is it difficult? Well, no, I don't think so, but it's really important. Yeah. And a parabola may have two x-intercepts. That can happen where you get two x-intercepts, but it's also possible to get one x-intercept, but it's also possible to get no x-intercepts. And if that's hard to visualize, I'll do three little pictures right here. I just left a little tiny bit of space. I'll draw three parabolas, one that has two x-intercepts, one that has one x-intercept, and one that has no x-intercept. See, if it goes right through the axis, you'll see it will meet the x-axis twice if it goes right through. But it's possible that maybe it goes down and meets the x-axis and only hits that one time. But it's also possible it never meets the x-axis. So that will come up, especially as we start to discuss the quadratic formula. You'll start to see, oh, it's possible to get no answers here, but it's possible to get two answers here as well. So quadratic functions are often written as y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. Looking ahead, that'll be good when we're using the quadratic formula. We'll like it in that form if we have to use the quadratic formula, which is called standard form. But other times we won't like standard form because it won't give us enough information. Sometimes we'll want to write it like this, which is weird looking. If that's weird looking to you right now, just hang on. Let the lesson finish. For now, this is a weird looking thing, and it's, but it is called vertex form, and the name of it gives a major hint of what it accomplishes. It finds the vertex quite easily using the transformations that we have from last chapter, and all Finish this off in just a minute. This is your reference sheet. If, you're, if that's a little confusing, like, well, how do I get it to vertex form? What does it look like? Why is that vertex form? Yeah, that's all coming up. For now, it's just a list of what it is. For the quadratic function, y equals a bracket x minus h plus k, the vertex is h comma k. And the reason that is, is it's been moved right h and up k. That's just the transformations in action there. So if that a is positive, the parabola will open up. If the a value is negative, the parabola will open down. That's the second time I've mentioned that. And the procedure to switch from standard form to vertex form is called completing the square. And if you hated this last year, you're going to have to get over it. It's the key skill of this chapter. That is, there might be a question that says, here, complete the square to find the vertex. There might be a word problem that says, find the max min, and you've got to complete the square to find the vertex. There might be a question that says, find the zeros by completing the square. Half the test might require you to complete the square. So take a deep breath about that and go, I better listen to what he says in a second about how to complete The procedure is called completing the square. I don't even know why it's called completing the square. What's it got to do with squares? Coming up in just a minute, I'm going to talk all about completing the square. Do you have any questions thus far? Thus. Oh, you know it's a good lesson when I can throw thus in there, eh? Do you need any more time? Some of you are tired from dancing the night away last night, are you? Not me. I wasn't. Mrs. Todd did the dance thing. I was at home supervising the kids. More time?
Mr. Todd, can we complete the square a few times so I remember how to do it? Oh, why, sure we can. I start with really, really easy ones that will help me explain what complete the square is, why it's called complete the square, and why it's so good. Then I'll ramp it up a little bit in part B. Then I'll ramp it up a lot more in part C. Then it'll completely come off the rails in part D. And then E and F, well you saw you might get a funny face in there. So that's what we gotta do. Six complete the square examples. But if you really don't know what complete the square is and what it's all about, here I'm gonna reteach it like you've never seen it before. Okay? The real problem with standard form is we have two different x terms. That's the, that's the problem with standard form. That's really good when we go to do quadratic formula, which you've seen before, and I'm gonna teach it as if you've never seen it before in another lesson, okay? So you don't have to panic about that, but I'm just looking ahead a little bit. This form actually is good if you were doing the quadratic formula. But if I wanted the vertex, then having two different x terms, that is two different, an x squared and an x, that's not going to work. You're like, why not? Watch when I complete the square. Here's what I'm gonna do. It's gonna seem random at first, but it's my best explanation of this. I want to be able to factor x squared plus 6x plus blank. Better yet, I want to factor it so that it's a square, a perfect square. You should be skeptical. You're like, well, how are you going to make it do that? It's not. It's not, even a, it's not even a trinomial yet. I'm like, okay, magic number coming. And hopefully you remember this enough that in a second someone can explain how I'm going to come up with this magic number because it's not that magic. It's going to seem magic right here. I'm going to act like it's magic because I like to entertain myself up here. Here comes the magic number. Does anyone else know what the magic number is? I love the awkward pause. It gives your brain a time to shake out, you know, Stop thinking about last night's dance. Stop worrying about what you're going to have for lunch and go, oh, he thinks this is important. I better listen. So even if you don't know the answer, you're ready for the magic here. Here it comes, the magic number. Nine is the magic number. Please don't then conclude, okay, I just always use nine? No. This one's magic number is nine. First. Question, how did you get the magic number? That's a good question. Second question, so you're just allowed to add nine to things? I'll deal with the second question first. No, you're not allowed to just add nine to things. The only number you can add to something and not change it is, what is the only number that you can add to things and it won't change them? Zero. I'm allowed to add zero. So if I want positive 9, it comes with negative 9. Positive 9's painful friend is negative 9. You can invite positive 9 to your party. Positive 9 will come to your algebra party. But if positive 9's coming, it's got to bring its cousin negative 9. You don't get one without the other. Now it's okay. Now it's legal, first of all. Now, let me show what it can do. And then I'll circle back and talk about what the magic number is and how do I get the magic number. Just look at these first three now. What two numbers multiply to 9 but add to 6? 3 and 3. That's why this procedure is so important. That's why the magic number is important. I put the exact right number there that this would not only factor, it would factor as x plus 3 and then x plus 3 again. Why do you care? You don't care yet. Give it a couple more lines before you care. Meanwhile, minus 9 is over here going, well, okay, I, you invited me to the party, but I, I don't get to be part of the factoring? You're like, yes. You go over and sit in the corner. You're not part of the party, really. You had to, you had to be invited. I get it. You just sit over there, play on your phone. Don't disturb the rest of us. That's not the really great line. Here's the really great line. x plus 3 times x plus 3 can be written as x plus 3 all squared. See, the 9 was the perfect magic number that allowed me to factor this quadratic as 
a square. Let me say it again. The nine was the perfect number that made this thing factor as a square. So the nine completed the square. It was the number that made it that I could factor this as a square. You're like, I don't even know why I care that it factors as complete the square. To which I say, oh yeah, you do. Because now I can tell you what the vertex is. Does anyone remember enough about this now? From grade 10 to go, oh, I can see what the vertex is. This is y equals x squared moved three units left over to negative three, nine units down, down to negative nine. There, all in one example, that explains everything about why we complete the square. We want to factor as a square because then we'll be able to see the horizontal translation. And with that, the vertical translation. Both of those together meets, I can find the vertex. Okay. Back to the magic number. For this to factor with a 6 there, what's eventually going to come into the brackets is a 3, half of that. And the number I need to come out of the brackets would be that number squared. 3 squared is 9. So that's where that comes from. That's the relationship here. So I'm going to write something really important at the bottom here. Two complete, well, you better write this down. Yeah? The homework asks something specifically about this. That's so easy if you know this sentence, and so hard if you don't. To complete the square, C must be half of B squared. That's the number that will complete the square. There's the magical sentence. The magic number we need is half of B squared. That will make it work. Why is it half of B squared? Because what's going to be in the brackets will be half the B, and when I expand that brackets out because of FOIL, that last term will be the 3 squared. I slowed down there because I wanted to say the words just right on the video. I wanted to, if you have to rewatch this to go, what the heck is going on here? Well, like lots of math examples, sometimes the first time through you're like, I sort of get it, but not really. That's okay. That's why we do six examples. If it was obvious, we'd only need one example. Let's take a look at this one. y equals x squared plus 8x minus 7. Immediately start thinking about what the magic number is. Over here off to the side, you write, okay, what's b divided by 2 then squared? The b this time is 8 divided by 2 is 4 squared is 16. That's the magic number I want. Here's the easiest question of the day. Is negative 7 equal to 16? No. It's not the right number that they gave me there. That's annoying. So, I'm going to put 16 in there. And I'm going to put it right there. You should object. Your stomach should flip. You should be like, what? You can't just go around adding 16s to things. That changes what they are. What's the only number I'm allowed to add to things that doesn't change them? Zero. So you can have plus 16. You invite, oh, I need plus 16 at this party. Yeah, plus 16. Cool, cool, cool person. Yeah? Call him up. Yeah? 16, I need you. Right. Okay, but I'm babysitting my uh, little cousin. I, I, I can't come unless I can bring my cousin. All right, bring him over. He's got to come too. Meanwhile, negative sevens are like, so um, I'm sitting in the corner too? And the answer is, yeah, that's exactly right. Negative seven, you're like, negative seven, get out of the way. Go sit in the corner. 
It's okay though, I brought a friend for you. Negative 16. So sit over there for a second while we get this figured out. If you've done it right, you can think of it this way. What two numbers multiply to 16 but add to 8? 4 and 4. 16 completed the square. It made it perfect. And I'll show the extra line. As you move along, you probably won't show this line, but I'll show it. x plus 4, x plus 4. Over here, negative 16 and negative 7 have been talking, though. And they decide they're going to hang out all night together. Like, forget you guys. I know you think we're the not cool ones, but over here, we're just going to make negative 23. You don't want us? You don't get us. We're over here. Meanwhile, over here, we're like, oh, x plus 4 times x plus 4 is x plus 4 squared. We've completed the square. Why do we care? Because now we can see the transformations. We can see that this thing's been moved left 4 and down 23, which means the vertex is negative 4, negative 23. Do you see why this is called vertex form now? Because getting the vertex takes no effort, as long as you know the stuff from last chapter. Not all the stuff, just the left, right, and the up, down. That's all you need here to find the vertex. How am I doing? Is the rust coming off this from last year? You're supposed to have seen all this last year, and as I'm doing it, I hope you're like, oh, I kind of remember this from my nightmares. Yeah. Maybe you literally. Maybe you're laying in bed one night, woke, uh, sat right up in a nightmare, you're like, oh, complete the square. Oh, oh geez, okay, I'm okay. Yeah. Better get it nailed down this time, folks. It won't take you long to write the test if you can't complete the square. You'll be done quick. You won't need extra time. Yeah. Got to complete the square. Got to. Do you have any questions about my opening two shots at completing the square? Those aren't the ones that upset people. I don't know how it's taught in grade 10, but if they go to do complete the square and they do ones with no coefficient, no A value out front, well, A is one, but if no other A value out front, everybody goes home and does the homework and goes, I like completing the square, that's good. You come back the next day and the teacher goes, oh yeah? Well, I'm glad you do because here we go. There's an A value out front now. There was an A value in the other one. It was just one. Yeah. Now the A value is negative three which is a major problem. The whole complete the square thing doesn't work properly with a coefficient out front. Let me say that again. This procedure will not work with an A value like that out front. If only there was a way to get it off the x squared and out of the way for a few minutes. Can anyone think of a procedure that gets coefficients off of that first variable. Any ideas, anything at all that you can come up with? Hazel? Common factor it. Common factor it. And I'm going to break a rule here. Uh -oh, can't do that. I'm going to common factor out the negative 3. But I really want you to complain about what I'm going to do next, okay? okay? I really want someone to raise their hand and complain. Kaya has been pretty quiet the whole time. Now's the time to get involved. All right, get ready. x squared minus 4x. So far, nothing's happened. Oh, no, 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 Mr. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, no, no. Well, why didn't you factor it off the 2? I'm like, the 2 isn't invited to the party anyways. Yeah? You could, you could do it. You could common factor off the 2, and it's going to be the wrong number. It's going to be in the way. It's going to spoil the party. Tell the 2, go sit in the corner. I might have some friends for you to hang out later, but for now, just play Angry Birds on your iPad in the corner, and let us have our party here, our algebraic party. That's all it takes. That's all it takes. Now I can use my complete the square procedure, because it's now an x squared, not a 3x squared. Because what's the magic number now? Half of negative 4 squared. Oh, I've got to use the new b, not the old b. The new B. So I actually don't, it's not my favorite when we use B. When we say, oh, take B over 2 squared. It's not my favorite. It's half of the X term squared. That's a better way to say it because the, the B changed here. Yeah? So up here, a little thought bubble. This is how I like writing it. A little thought bubble up here where you go, okay, negative 4 
over 2 and square that. Negative 4, half of negative 4 is negative 2. Squared is 4. That's who I'm going to invite to the party. 4 is the person I need. 4. Hey, hey, 4. Come to the party. 4 is like, hey, you know I'd love to come. My mom's maybe can me babysit my cousin. Can I bring negative 4 along? It's the only way I can come. Like, yeah, okay, get him in here. All right, so you bring him. x squared minus 4x plus 4 minus 4. The minus 4 has to stay with plus 4 here. It cannot go outside the brackets when it shows up at the party. I'll get it out of there, but right now it's stuck inside the brackets. That's where 4 went. That's where negative 4 has got to go. I love squiggling those three. Squiggle those three. Shows what you know what's going on here. What two numbers multiply to positive 4, but add to negative 4? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh, ooh. What two numbers multiply to positive? Negative 2. Yeah? If you've done it right, there will be the same number twice. So that's x minus 2 squared. Is it too early for me to skip that other step? No, maybe not. Okay, you tell me. Maybe you want to write, oh, negative x minus 2, x minus 2, but it's x minus 2 squared. And then I'm going to write the last two steps, and then we'll get someone to complain again about what I've done, okay? Yeah, should be a complaint. Take a second and come up with your complaint. You can't do that, Mr. Todd. What, what, can't, what, what did I do? Yeah, you just did like uh, the 12 and the 2. Yeah, where's this 12 come from? Yeah. Are, are you okay with the 2? You okay with the 2? Yeah, because we left him out, but now yeah. we're going to have some friends. Right, so negative 3 uh, times all this, and, and negative 3. Outside the bracket. And uh, yeah, yeah, watch uh -oh. this. Add this arrow into yours. Use this arrow, like from here to forever. Because my calculus students, we're, we're completing the square, all of a sudden everybody forgets that move right there. That negative 3 gets multiplied by that negative 4. Now I can get the vertex. 2, 14. And we're really going to care about that. Somebody up in the front row, today, I don't know who it was, Carter, was it you, said, uh, Math's got nothing to do with the real world, someone said over here. Us, I definitely. Was that you that said that? Maybe. Do you have a cell phone there? Yes, I do. Math has nothing with the real world? And you've got a cell phone? Yeah. I know I didn't say that. I probably said that. Math, top to bottom, inside and out. Everything that was built here was math. Well, no. It's like, it uses like algebra. <laughs> what? <laughs> You're right. This one's way too easy to build a phone. It's like, this would be like the intro to the algebra that you need for making a phone. What's like the hardest algebra there is? I guarantee you I'll answer in five seconds. No, one minute actually, one minute. I'd actually solve it in five minutes. <laughs> I'm being so serious. You know what? You need a pillow, because you're dreaming. What do you mean? Like, you need a pillow to lay down on, because it's clear you're dreaming. What's the hardest algebraic equation? I would say Fourier analysis is the hardest algebra there is. So buy that? yourself a book on Fourier analysis. Can you do that? Like, you know, like, can you do all kinds of math? Or you, like, because I always thought, like, would you have, like, maybe forgotten the math that you, like, did learn? Oh, yeah, no, he's actually right about that. There is stuff that I took in university that at the time I could do it and if you put it in front of me now I'd be like just a second here and I, it would take me a while to, to work. It's sort of like you and complete the square. Some of you might be looking at complete the square and going I could do this, I sort of remember but ah, I don't know if I could do it right now. You know, just take me a minute to read it over. So you're absolutely right. There's some third and fourth year stuff that I would be like. You probably learned like university level math but you've been teaching for like, like 28 years. You're absolutely right. 28 years. Jeez. 30? 23. 
you're, you're right. There are definitely things that have slipped over, all over that time. Yeah. Okay. At that moment, you're like, okay, not so bad. Common factor that thing off. Should be okay. Check this one out. First step, if there's an A value not equal to one out there, it's got to go. It's got to common factor off. So you common factor off and you get two X squared and then five divided by two. One half. Sort of. That does equal a half. Are we okay with me leaving the nine out now? Do you see why I'm up to it? The nine probably isn't the right thing anyways, so I'm leaving that out of it for now. Why not make the five over two a decimal? Oh, what a great question. This course is called 11U Math. It's supposed to get you ready to work anywhere. That is, in this pathway, you could be getting ready to be an accountant, computer scientist, engineer, Here's the problem with using decimals. This decimal is actually pretty nice. If this was all we had to do, 2.5, oh, you're using a good word there. This particular decimal is, what's, is, is almost a discrete decimal. 2.5 would be the whole story. It's a nice decimal. Yeah. Let me, let's talk about some not nice decimals. 10 yeah? Over three. 10 over 3. It's just, come on guys, it goes on forever. Yeah? And it's hard to know where to round. I'm telling you, if you want to own an iPhone, nobody did any rounding. There's no almost in this. It was all exact mathematics. Wait, Mr. So, hang on, not rounding is exact mathematics. So if you want to work at Apple or build iPhones some days, we don't round. If you want to work at Samsung? Well, okay, then do whatever. It doesn't matter. Wait, but kind of like, yeah, that, that doesn't really make sense though, because it does, it, is it never ending or does it end somewhere? It never ends. Okay, but that means you're always going to be missing like a point, zero, zero, zero. Exactly my point. There's no way to keep this exact because it just keeps on going. There's no way to round it off. So don't use decimals unless something about the question tells you to. And this question, no doesn't tell you to, so we're stuck with the fractions. Okay, now, magic number. Half of 5 over 2 squared. Oh, that's easy. Is it? Yeah. All right, tell me. So, um, if you're going to square it, you're going to do... Oh, you do it out of it. So, you divide them b both by 2. You, oh, you times the 2 the two, and then you're going to do um, two times the two and the two, and then you cross multiply. No, 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 because then you do the, you just distribute. Mm -hmm. Ah, it's not called distribution, but yeah, okay. Okay, then you're going to do, uh, I want to say it's going to be 25 over uh, 16, and that's going to get, uh, no, we'll just leave it there, we'll leave it there. Yeah. Did I actually get that right? Yeah. Holy sort of. I was with you. I was with you. Um, is this bad fraction stuff? Well, yeah, if you don't like fractions, this is bad. The only good news I have is this particular fraction work is the same every single time. You're going to be dividing by two, which is multiplying by a half, and then you're going to be squaring. So I'm not about to set you up with a million different fraction questions. We're going to have to take a fraction, divide it by two, which is the same as multiplying by a half, which we talked about last chapter, but maybe you remember it from, do you remember learning fractions in grade eight and nine? They're like, to divide a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal. So you, uh, uh, I don't know, did your teacher have a short form to say this? Oh, bad maths. No. So that's the magic number this time. That's what you gotta worry about here, is crazy, Fraction. So I want 25 over 16 at the party, and you can say, I don't want 25 over 16 at my party, but if, I, if I'm going to complete the square, I'm going to need, him outside the party. I'm going to need 25 over 16. 25 over 16 can only come to the party if subtract 25 over 16 is allowed to 2. He has to leave the party. He's going to leave the party in just a minute, yeah, for sure. He has to leave 
Now, this is really difficult, but I have some hints. I'll first ask the question, then I'll have some hints for you. I'll rewind to get some hints. What two numbers multiply to 25 over 16? Four. Sorry, and, but add to negative 5 over 2. It's actually on your page. Let me just do a little highlight here. Can you write that out? Isn't it negative 5? It'll be there for you. So you don't have to think this through as much as you think. It's out there being ready, ready to go. So it's this. You're like, wait a minute. The one in the brackets just half? Yeah, it was. Look at negative 4 became negative 2. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The one in the brackets just the one in the bracket squares to give the other one? Yeah, negative 2 squared is 4. So it, it all works together. But again, you might want to highlight that and go, the number I need is going to be laying right there in this procedure. A little extra fraction work for you on a, what day of the week is this? This, this might bother some people, so I'll. I'm going to hesitate there. I'm not, I'm not trying to act like that's easy, but I wanted to get it all down on the page so that you can decide what your question is there. You should have lots of questions. I'm not trying to act like that's just the easiest thing you ever saw. I'm just trying to get it all down there so people can look at it, process it, think about what just happened there, and then ask their questions. Why did they put that back there? I don't, know. don't be embarrassed. It's our fault what happened with fractions. Let me explain why I take some responsibility for your fraction trouble. In grade 7, we teach you adding and subtracting fractions in common denominator, and things are okay. Grade 8, we teach you multiplying and dividing, and don't review adding and subtracting enough, and everybody gets messed up. In grade 9, we beat you up with fractions for a while, and then grade 10, we act like they're, that we don't even care about fractions anymore. And then they reappear in grade 11, and we're surprised that you don't remember all the little things. I'm not surprised. I'm not offended. I'm not like, oh, you should know this. No, I, I don't know. Well, what do you want to talk about here in these fraction steps? Because there's... I'll be blown away if everybody's like, yep, that's good. What step do you want to talk about? <laughs> Just yawned in the middle of my lesson. All right, how did we get from 9 to 144 over 16? Is that the question you're going to ask? I pictured 9 as over 1. And then to get a common denominator, I multiply top and bottom by 16. Is this okay, though, once I accomplish that? Negative 50 plus 144 is 94. Maybe you've got to use your calculator. That's fine. And then I just reduced the fraction there. I saw they were both even numbers, so I reduced the fraction. Can't you do more, though? No. Well, you could get this as 5 and 7 eighths, but I'm not really sure that that is necessarily helpful here. Uh, other questions? Okay, let's rate these on a scale of 1 to 100 to how difficult they are. Okay. That's already a 50, to remember all the, the pieces of this. That's the hardest one. This one, like a 52, you're like, oh, you got to keep track of the negative 7. That's like a 100. To note a common factor, handle it, remember to multiply it out. So on a difficulty 1 to 100, that's like a 107. Like that is like out of sight. So don't be too harsh on yourself as you struggle with those to start off with. I don't think the homework gets carried away with those right off the hop. Let me look at your homework and see when the first time I see that come up. In question one, they give you A, B, C, D, which aren't too bad, and then D, E, F, G, all go crazy with fractions. Question two, they give you two nice ones, and then they give you two hard ones. 
Question three, they give you four nice ones, then two hard ones. So it, it's a balance, it goes back and forth. So every time you do a new question, you have to go, okay, let me try it without fractions, now let me try it with fractions. Okay. So just to get you ready, we'll do two wild fraction ones. Oh, that one's not so bad. I don't know why they're acting like that one's so bad. This one's tough. This one's tough. And if it's tough, that's not the tough step. All I did there was go, I don't know why you wrote the x squared term second, but that's not the way we want it. We want it this way around. We want the x squared first. Common factor out the negative 3. And that is really easy, except it's so darn hard. But take a look at what I did for the common factor there. Did you switch them around? Yeah, I just went, okay, I'm dividing negative 3 out of this one, so I divided negative 3 out of that one. That's not the hard part. Here's the hard part. I got to take negative 5 over 3, divide it by 2, and square it to get the magic number. Really difficult, except it's the same in every complete the square question. Negative 5 over 3 times 1 over 2, which you can think of as, hey, if I'm dividing by 2, that's the same as multiplying by a half. Or you can go, okay, multiply by the reciprocal, and I get negative 5 over 6, and I square both, which is 25 over 16. 25 over 36, sorry. I did that fast on purpose. Not to rush the lesson, but to try to convince you that once you get this little procedure down, it doesn't have to take that long. But it's going to take a while to get used to how to divide a fraction by 2 and square it. Now, here it comes. y equals negative 3, x squared minus 5 over 3x. Don't get too worried about the fractions. I've now figured out that 25 over 36 is the magic number. So I just add it in there. Am I allowed to just add 25 over 36? No, can't do that. But as long as I bring this in, negative 25 over 36, then it's okay. Now factor these guys, which again, I'm telling you, I do not think of this. I don't, in my brain goes, what multiplies to 25 over 36? and adds to negative 5 thirds. I do not think that way. I go back and I find it. It's over there somewhere. 5 over 6? That's the one. Perfect. And I'm going to simplify that down, but then I need someone to tell me what the heck happened there. Are these both divided by 3? I think they do. Who's with me? Where did 75 over 36 come from? Ben. Uh, you multiply negative Do this every time. This procedure is not easy, but it is very repetitive. If you just practice it, you'll have it down pat. People who are not particularly good at math have mastered complete the square just by going, oh, I'll try another one. Oh, I'll try another one. And then at some point they go, I got it. Like learning to ride a bicycle. Have you ever tried to teach someone to ride a bicycle? It's the most nightmarish thing you've ever done. It's the worst. It was easier to teach my older two kids to drive a car than to ride a bicycle. It's the weirdest thing. So let me just give you an example of it. This is what you're going to look like completing the square this weekend. No, not this weekend. Monday night. You might be studying for the test all weekend. The first five hours of teaching someone to ride the bicycle is running behind them, holding the seat like this, going, ah, ah. It's so awkward, you almost kill yourself. And meanwhile, the kid's yelling at you the whole time. Daddy, don't let go. Daddy, don't let go. Because they're scared, right? So you're like, ah. But then somewhere along the way, you start to realize, oh, I think they got it. But meanwhile, they're screaming at you. Don't let go, Daddy. Don't let go, Daddy. And then somewhere, you'll find it. If you complete the square enough times, if you practice bicycling enough times, if you're with me on the analogy, you'll start to go, and I'll just go, ah, ah, ah. And they bike all the way down the street, and they look back and they go, Daddy! And then they smash into something. But, but, they, <laughs> but they got it. They got it. That's where you've got to get with complete the square. Is it easy? No. No. It's 11U math. What, easy? That's gone. No, we, we left easy behind. It's over. With practice, though, 
can be fairly good. Who thinks they can at least quote the steps to me and I'll be the fill-in fraction person? When there's a coefficient out front, what's your first move? Common factor of that thing out. So I'm taking 6 out of everything here. So this is x squared plus 2 over 6x. That is how I would write it. Just divide that thing by 6. Make your life easier in this particular case by reducing that fraction. Don't go too fast and make mistakes there, Bobby. I call myself Bobby when I make mistakes because I don't really like that nickname. So when I make mistakes, I call myself Bobby. Now, don't worry about the fractions. Tell me the next step. Now that I've got that A off of there, what do I do with this one third? Oh. Oh, now we do the, the protest of like, uh, like power, or not power, uh, like divide multiply. Yeah, yeah. Down off to the side somewhere. One third divided by two, all squared. Difficult fraction procedure, but the exact same every single time. So you go one third times a half, all squared, I get 1 sixth squared, which is 1 over 36. Easy. Let me show easy. I don't know. They need to make math harder. They did. And this is difficult until you know what you're looking for. Two numbers that multiply to 1 over 36 but add to 1 third. There's a hint out there. It's on your page somewhere. Right there. And if you're doubtful about that, what's 1 sixth times 1 th sixth? 1 over 36. What's 1 sixth plus 1 sixth? 2 sixth, which is the 1 third. So then that's a x plus 1 sixth. I'm going to make a mistake here. Are you ready? Your job to catch it. Because this is the mistake most people make. I didn't multiply that. That is the number one mistake. Uh, maybe you're sitting there going, oh, I don't know if I'll be able to divide by 2 and square. I don't know if I remember the order. That's not usually the problem. Usually it's this. Draw the arrow. I'll give a mark for the arrow. When I'm marking these, if you write the arrow, I'll give you a mark for the question just on that alone. Go, oh, they wrote the arrow. That's good. Everything's going to be okay. As long as they write the arrow, the rest of it they'll get figured out. So this isn't negative 1 over 36. This is negative 6 over 36. And then I'll th throw the last two steps up there, and then you can complain, okay? Let me just put a little box around this so you don't get confused with everything else. That was just me thinking somewhere. I don't have a lot of space. On your page, you can go up in the top corner somewhere and go, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hazel? Yes, if you're good at fractions, this actually gets, it can go a lot faster than what I've shown here. Like right here, when I went 6 times 1 over 36, you'd be like, 6 over 36? Oh, 1 over 6. And you jump right ahead. Yeah, so hopefully your fractions are. So if I got negative 1, you're still right? Negative 1 where? Like, you reduce, or no, like 6 mm -hmm. divided by 36. Is 1 over 6? So negative 6 plus No, negative 1 over 6. You flipped it in the meantime. It, wasn't, it didn't end up being 6 over 1, it ended up being 1 over 6. No, it's 6 over 36. Yes? So if I reduce it, it becomes 1 over 6. Yeah. 
Here, let me write it over here. Let me go, I'll go to a new page. I'll come back if you need to. Yeah? I know exactly what you're saying. And I think you're probably very quick at these. And maybe just a heartbeat too quick there. You were, you were a little too fast. You went, oh, 36, 6, that divides. Oh, yeah, it does. But the 36 is bigger. It's the denominator. Any other questions? I'm telling you folks, this stuff's just practice. It's not crazy mathematics. You just got to practice your fractions. If you don't want to practice them, it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to be a nightmare. We want to practice at some point, you know, first one, ooh, that didn't go too well. Second one, ah, I'm not very good at this. Third one, like, ah, I'm starting to get this a little bit. Fourth one, fifth one, you start to get, starts to come along, right?